Um, so yeah, I'm Chris Freed. Uh, I've been uh, running this actually with uh, Stefan for years. This is the, this is I believe this is our fifth year, and it's a little bit weird because it's 2003 minus 2019. So it seems like it's four, but it's actually five years. It's our fifth year because first one was in Lisbon, and then two years remote, and then double, uh, Dublin, and now we're over here in Richmond. So thanks a lot for coming. Um, our uh, original speaker, uh, Florian, had a personal emergency at the very last minute, uh, and so I asked if I could deliver his talk for him. Um, I'm fairly familiar with his material, and I've been really uh, kind of helping him along with uh, the processes in the Zephyr side. Uh, there's still, I, I would say, a, a fair bit of work to do on the Linux side, but uh, that's another story. Uh, we'll get to that. So yeah. Um, we're talking about uh, sub gigahertz industrial IoT uh, with 802.15.4. Uh, and originally by Florian, as I said. Um, so here we are. Um, basically, we're going to be talking about 15.4 as it was in Zephyr before Florian took over. Uh, and I can probably be blamed for some of that. Uh, specifically, the CC13XX uh, driver, uh, 26XX uh, sub gigahertz. That was, you can blame me for that totally. Um, so Florian came along and uh, he was talking about uh, T uh, Tish, they say in Germany, but uh, TSCH, uh, which is time synchronized channel hopping. Um, so extremely time critical, um, much like Bluetooth low energy. Um, this is a very interesting slide. So if you take a look at this, you see on the, I don't know what label that would be, maybe Z. Uh, we have 2.4 gigahertz, sub gigahertz, and then ultra wide band. Uh, that's the progression of the physical layer, right? Um, and you know, transceivers are getting more and more complex. Uh, uh, with ultra wide band, you get extremely great uh, spatial resolution, which is awesome. Uh, and then, of course, on the y-axis, I guess it would be. We originally had you know simple transmit receive, uh, clear channel assessment, and energy uh, density scan. Uh, and then, of course, we get to the timing, the timing issue. So that's a distributed clock problem, right, where we have multiple transceivers that have to have clocks that are extremely, extremely synchronized. And, of course, uh, time distance of arrival, that's where you're measuring how far it is to an object in front of you using RF. Um, and then, of course, the application part of that on the x-axis, um, for sure, home automation, that's where I started out with this stuff. Uh, industrial is the next step. And then uh, indoor navigation is actually what Florian was really uh, aiming for there. So, uh, and of course, I have to say, I have been super impressed with Florian's work in the Zephyr community. Um, I hope at some point we can continue that. Uh, I know that he's got a lot of stuff on his plate right now, but he came on and he fixed the sub gigahertz driver for the Texas Instruments chip. I know that there are some people from Texas Instruments here today. Uh, so I'm really hoping that they can take this message back to the wireless division and say, we're making this chip fly, like let your Zephyr kite fly. And it's going really well. So he's got it down just to amazing, amazing resolutions and, and uh, tolerances. Uh, so we started off with 2.4 gigahertz. This is a dual band radio. Uh, and then we went to sub gigahertz. Zephyr is almost there where you have uh, dual stack. And you can actually represent both at the same time with a network interface. That's actually kind of the next uh, step, if you will. And I remember we started that off a long time ago with BeagleBoard. Uh, so Jason, if you're watching, you know I'm talking about. I was talking about this years ago. Uh, he knows all about that. So first we get to sub gigahertz, and then finally we get to ultra wideband, which is I believe it's called Corva. I'm not super familiar with it, as familiar with Florian, he knows all about this stuff. I believe this is a company that has some interest in getting their chip supported with Zephyr. So uh, if anybody wants to hack really wicked radio transceivers, get in touch with me and we'll get in touch with um, the original author and we'll hopefully get in touch with Corvo as well. Uh, and of course, uh, part of what Florian did with Zephyr was uh, he was synchronizing with Nordic Semiconductor, NXP, uh, Texas Instruments, Microchip, basically all the big players in the, in the field, uh, getting a vendor agnostic link layer, uh, or L2, I suppose, uh, making sure that we can hand off things at the right layer 
to the hardware and keep all the software common. That, that way we don't you know, waste cycles, essentially. Nobody wants to waste their time. So uh, Florian was doing an amazing job of that, <laughs> just got to say. So here we go uh, with Corva, and I believe it's called, um, uh, what is RTLS? I, I wish I could remember this off to my head. I have like a horrible memory here. Um, Real-time location service, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that's, of course, a part of I IoT, industrial IoT. Um, the RTLS is primarily used in the medical industry. Uh, this is for uh, keeping, keeping awareness, uh, keeping track of all of your assets throughout the hospital. Um, it's, it's extremely expensive because if something sits on a shelf for too long, it's going to expire. You're going to have to throw it out. It's expensive. Um, hospitals don't want to suffer that expense. So this would have been a, would have been a solution for that. Uh, um, and actually, I, I'm sort of new to this as well, but FIRA, there's an existing consortium for this, uh, ultra wideband. Um, they're also in the area of, of indoor uh, tracking, indoor location uh, sort of services. Uh, using ultra wideband. Um, so again, you get that really great spatial resolution with ultra wideband, and um, I guess they have the the best transceivers on the market. Maybe that's why he's chasing them down. So maybe they're watching. And uh, yeah, if you want to get your stuff in Zephyr, get in touch with me. I have a couple of people lined up who are really interested in doing radio work. So um, aha, this is where we dig into the dirt. <laughs> Florian fixed a couple of the. Um, inconsistencies that I added um, with uh, 15.4. So um, basically what we want to do is we want to just use the socket API. We don't really care about the physical layer from, from the network layer up there, from the, from the applications perspective. Uh, we just want it to work. Um, so that was the goal. Um, it was working using the sub gigahertz approach that I had done originally. Uh, the problem with that was that it was actually non-standard. So it was not uh, interoperable with other transceivers out there. Uh, we basically just uh, did what we could do to get it to work uh, with the existing Linux subsystem. And I, it's still not 100% clear to me if uh, all those pages are correct in Linux. It's been that long since I've looked at this. Um, but that's kind of where we're headed uh, with uh, Florian and also uh, you know, obviously we've got Stefan and, and Alex in the room too. So um, a lot of collaboration there. Um, so in any case, you know, the, that. So on the Linux side, we're also extending a little bit of going for, for other bands like ultra wideband as well. Um, a lot slower, obviously, than, than Zephyr, but I think Miguel also has, has a long-term goal. He has also ultra wideband work on his plate as well. So that. Hopefully that would involve some of the DecaWave uh, hardware you're mentioning. Um, I think that that's the connection here, right? Corvo bought DecaWave and that's how they get all the ultra wideband uh, stuff in there. So that's definitely also they, something you want I, to look at. I think the all the bands and all the pages and so on, the, uh, all the layers that should be okay now on the Linux side, but um, yeah, there might be a small bug here or there. I think it's important, actually, uh, from the perspective of the Linux Foundation, I think we really need to solidify that because that's something that people expect to work right out of the box. When they uh, use an embedded Linux solution and a Zephyr solution, uh, it's basically the same community that's providing that. And so I think it should be a priority for us to kind of nail down that uh, interoperability, maybe with one or two different radios, but we'll get there. Uh, I'm just glad that people are working on it. So. Uh, I thought I saw Mikel uh, really briefly. Is he around yeah. as well? I just wanted to confirm that uh, that was a longer term goal. Uh, for now, there is no ultra white band support at all in, in Linux. Uh, but uh, I currently have a, well, a work in pro progress branch uh, where I'm working on that. So I had, I suffered from some hardware issues recently, so it's not yet upstream, but I would really want to see this uh, uh, at least sent on the mailing list, well, first quarter of 2024, maybe. Excellent. And do you think you want to get in touch in the Zephyr side as well at some point? I probably have someone that would be very interested in working on that with you. Uh, you mean on, on which... Uh... On which part? 
uh, just making sure that we can uh, speak to Linux from Zephyr using ultra wideband. Oh yeah, uh, actually, um, that's something that I wanted to do. Uh, for now, I'm only focusing on one uh, on the Corvo and Deca Deca Wave uh, uh, transmitters. Uh, so yeah, I will need some hardware at some point to see if I can in interact with uh, other devices. Well, Excellent. I'm running uh, operating systems, of course. Yeah. So we'll sync up at some point. I think that's a good idea to do offline. Uh, and maybe we'll touch base with Florian too, because that, that was exactly where he was heading. So, uh, of course, yeah. So uh, Florian, one of the things he did was he actually looked at the IEEE spec in detail, <laughs> which is something that I was kind of rushing through at the time when I added this. Um, and he added uh, all the channel pages, not just the ones that could get his product out the door as quickly as possible. So I apologize for that. I did not have the... I think I was off by a couple of things, and I was just trying to reuse some of the logic from the 2.4 gigahertz band um, at the time, because that's what was available in Linux. Um, and it worked. Uh, but yeah, obviously, we want to be interoperable. We want to use other radios, too. Uh, so Florian did a great job fixing that in Zephyr. And I think you got all the silicon vendors on board as well. So. Um, the summary, effectively, like, yeah, he decoupled uh, the uh, link layer, L2, from IP, which is L3 in his uh, slides here, um, which is great. Um, I think that there was another goal that was actually kind of next on the agenda, which would have been the time synchronization aspect of this. Uh, and particularly in Zephyr, uh, I, uh, I'm the maintainer of POSIX. And I'm a kernel collaborator now, and actually that's definitely on my agenda. Uh, we want to have uh, pretty tight time synchronizations uh, for all the various clocks. Like, of course, we've got clock monotonic, we've got clock real time. Uh, but then we also want to have uh, sort of like a NTP type clock or something like that. Not NTP, it'll be different than NTP, but um, PTP essentially, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Keith. Um, this is a great trace here. Uh, so Florian, I, I'm not sure exactly which tool this is. I believe he was using something from uh, something from JLink or something like that. Uh, but he ended up getting like he ended up getting kind of the optimal power consumption for what he was working on. He could schedule transactions, uh, transmissions, receives that sort of thing, uh, and then shut down the radio immediately. Lose practically nothing. It was sipping power. It was perfect. Um, and then, of course, I think it's in the, maybe a subsequent slide, we'll see exactly what that margin is. Um, another really great uh, <laughs> contribution that uh, Florian made upstream in Zephyr was to just revamp the 802.15.4 documentation. Uh, he did a great job of that. And not just the documentation that's uh, facing you on the website, but he documented the code and the APIs really perfectly. So thanks again, Florian. That was amazing. Um, and yeah, yeah, he fixed all the bugs. So I'm happy with that. Yeah. And of course, I think a big, it's always a big challenge whenever you're dealing with um, a community that's dealing with different silicon vendors. You always have to come to a consensus. And Nordic is a huge player in this field. Uh, Florian went way out of his way to make sure that he was making sure that they felt secure enough to move forward with his patches. He jumped through all the hoops, provided all the timing diagrams. It was incredible. Um, so thanks again for that. And I, I know as well, like the, the people from Nordic that worked on this. So I'd like to thank them as well. One question <laughs> I have to Chris. So do you have any, yep. I mean, as far as I understand that Nordic has their own SDK, the Connect SDK based on Zephyr, but they also have like specific parts of the layer two of 15.4 for their drivers that are not in Zephyr upstream. How is that? I mean, I'm a bit confused about that. So they have like some specific implementations with some details that they only ship in the SDK or why, why is the difference there? I don't think that's the, the issue. I think the issue is that um, the uh, essentially the release schedule of Zephyr doesn't go as fast as they need it to. And so they probably have a fork where they put their temporary patches 
and then they kind of uh, schedule them. It's a, okay, I think it's more than a fork. I think also like the multi-protocol support where they like running on the same radio, Bluetooth and 15.4 and all kind of other things. They have like as extra functionality implemented in the SDK, but not in upstream. At least when I try, when I use Zephyr upstream, uh, on the, one of the Nordics board I'm having, it doesn't have all the, the features they are stating in the SDK at least. Yeah. So you don't know they anything about business. that. Okay. They have their own okay. business strategies and they make certain things available at certain time periods. And so you pretty much have to talk to the Nordic folk directly to understand what their strategies are. But um, you know they are very much committed to the project and moving things upstream. It's just a question of when it makes business sense for them. That's true. And every time, basically, we've been told, like, every time we get a question about the NRF, SDK, and the Zephyr community, we're actually just supposed to direct it back to Nordic. But I, I understand the, the frustration there, too. Uh, it should just work upstream. Um, I mean, it, it's not a I real mean, frustration, right? I mean, I'm, I'm basically, I'm quite happy. I mean, I use the, the Nordic boards with Thread and all the other things, and they do a great job supporting all of that. That's fine. I was just confused why they have, like, specific parts that are not part of it. But, I mean... What Kate explained here, like they have like different business topics going in there, and like that makes a lot of sense, like how they handle the SDK versus the upstream projects they're basing on. I wonder if there's like a coexistence issue as well, because maybe they're running Bluetooth. And when you have to get, you know, it's kind of certified with Bluetooth SIG, it's a whole other hairy situation. But I mean, I don't think there's any multi-band support in Zephyr, right? I mean, all the other vendors like uh, NXP and so on, they also don't have any multi-band, multi-protocol support, right? That's right. Yeah, we need a coexistent solution in Zephyr, which will, I believe, it'll be its own device. Um, and then it'll basically be a switch, essentially. Um, okay. Yeah, it's definitely been in plans for a long time. Um, we'll get to it, though. Um, yeah, so <laughs> actually, Florian, there, there's the... always the there's always the approach of you know someone starting upstream something that they they don't like and that motivates them to actually do theirs. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying well, I should this... bring up a really crappy solution and then hope that Nordic steps in and does it right? <laughs> well, I mean, that's sort of what happened though. I mean, we um, we'd really like to get TI more involved in supporting their own silicon and stuff like that. Because that was the chip that I was using. Um, but then if it's solved for text instruments, um, the Nordic should be able to use a very similar solution because Zephyr has a really great abstraction layer. Um, so that's my hope. I'm, I'm hoping that somebody, you know, they're scratching their own edge and they're able to upstream a fix for that. Uh, but if not, you know, maybe we'll get enough interest together from text instruments and, uh, you know, Corvo or whoever. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, back to Florian's fixes here. Um, so it looks like uh, he fixed the CSMA uh, clear channel assessment uh, back off problem. Um, it, what's strange here is that it looks like, uh, yeah, it looks like the jitter has increased. I'm a little bit confused about that. Um, so I don't know if I could actually go into detail and say like how it's fixed, uh, but it, I, I definitely trust him. Um, we'll see on the next slide, actually. I believe it's one of the next slides uh, where his margins are extremely good. But packet error rate definitely reduced. So that's a huge, huge bonus. Oh, sorry, the dropped packets went to zero. Yeah, obviously that's fixed, my mistake. So he fixed the upstream driver bugs, uh, stable. Um, he was able to run it. One of my criteria for this driver was that he was able to run it for an entire weekend without dropping a single packet. And that's what he did. So I was happy with that. And uh, I think that's what kind of convinced everyone else in the community too. Okay, precision timing and action, awesome. This is where we're going with the net time, yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, here we go. Uh, in terms of TSCH, uh, this is how it works. It's sort of like you've got your time and then you've got your channel. Uh, this brings you way back, way back to when I was dealing with like wideband CDMA because it's pretty similar, I think, uh, where you're scheduling transmission times and that sort of thing. 
Um, so it's very, uh, it's very strict in terms of the, uh, in terms of the timing requirements, in terms of the, um, in terms of the, uh, you know, what it's, what they're willing to tolerate, the tolerances. Uh, this was exactly the slide I was looking for. So um, it's a little bit difficult to see. Here we got uh, a one microsecond block here, and this the clock rate of this thing. If I'm not mistaken, is uh, about 70 megahertz, if I'm not mistaken, or something along those lines. Um, uh, that would be that would be the um, that would be like the core CPU frequency. So like whatever this is running at is probably stepped down from that. I would assume it, it's called the RAT R A T radio access timer or something like that on this particular part. Um, but yeah, if you look at these tolerances, like the expectation, the actual, uh, where he actually landed here, it's less than a microsecond. So I think that's very well within tolerances uh, for TSCH and uh, as well for something like Bluetooth. So uh, Bluetooth was one technology that we really wanted to support on this uh, chipset because it's supported, uh, just not with Zephyr stack. Uh, and there could be potentially some collaboration with text instruments there. I'm still hoping for that. Um, so we'll see uh, you know, how the attendees feel about that from TI. So let's look at this code. Net time reference API get. We set the trigger type. Get tick from time. So this is, I think it's also converting at some point between time points, which I believe Nico was uh, pretty uh, uh, opinionated about. Time points and another sort of reference clock, if you'll. Um, I'm actually fine as long as it's accurate <laughs> in terms of the, the core clocks. And of course, scheduled receive. So you wake up your radio, you turn the power on. This is where it's, well, transmit is obviously consuming more power, but receive is also, no? The problem is if you leave the receiver on for a long time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. If you leave the receiver on for a long time, you suck a lot of power. So the ability to keep the receiver off 99% of the time is a huge, huge power saver. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's why timing is so important. But then, of course, on some receivers, you also get like uh, bit corrections and stuff like that, or you're doing like multiple uh, uh, checksums against, uh, you know, whatever correlation thing, your, your correlation receiver you got set up. Um, so I think that actually all of those uh, transactions actually cost a little bit of uh, power every time. Uh, and it really adds up because this thing is going pretty fast. So um, yeah, this is definitely where Nico's getting old. So we've got the counter clock source layer, syntonization layer, which means uh, synchronized via frequency, uh, a distributed clock. And then we have the time scale layer, where we're converting, I believe it's the time point to some other representation. And then you have the clients. And that's me. I'm the client in this situation because I'm the POSIX maintainer. But really, I want the very accurate clock, and I want to feed that to all the other threads in the system. That's my ultimate goal, and I was 100% behind Florian to, uh, to get there. Hoping we still can. Um, there's probably going to be a little bit of um, API, uh, how, how do you say this? A uh, little bit of massaging to make it work uh, because I know that uh, in Zephyr, we have a pretty strong view of what time points are. We don't want to bend that. Um, we want basically everyone else to conform to what our uh, uh, concept of time is. Uh, so there could be a little bit of uh, probably a very minor amount of drift, but that should be taken into account with the protocol. Um, We've got a comment from Florian in the chat right now. You might want to rely oh. on. Sorry, what was that, Kate? Uh, there's a comment from Florian in the chat. Ah. Oh. Oh, yes, sorry. 
Well, it's got to be within one simple period for sure. Yeah. For sure. It, it was just that, that there was some, some comments like uh, how, if, if it's possible to do it in Linux and so on with all these timings. And of course, that is not really possible, but with Zephyr, Admirals, whatever, it's, I mean, it's working for years um, in all these other systems. So that's not a problem to yeah. get these timings correct. I can see it as a challenge for sure, though, because of that round yeah. trip delay. I'm um, going back to the microcontroller from Linux system for sure. Whereas I mean, if you're just running, like, oh, go ahead, Stefan, sir. I mean, on the Linux side, you would need some kind of like hardware offloading for that, depending on the transceiver does support that or not. The problem, on the other hand, is if you're going, for example, the, the uh, example with the AT USB thing, that means everything would have to go to USB, which doesn't really help timing wise, depending on what kind of herbs you're using. So that might not even work. So you might need to offload bigger chunks of work into the hardware and so on. We have to find a good middle ones there, but that's really for at least for Linux uh, WPAN, that's like future looking for a long term. Um, we need to have like a lot of other things in place before we can go to something like Tish or something like that. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's like a blocker necessarily for ultra wideband just by itself, but uh, for sure in terms of anything that's really timing sensitive, Zephyr should be there for Linux to be a smart peripheral where work can be, be offloaded to, right? So that's, I think, the ultimate goal um, to just get around that, that timing issue. It's a really good point. Thanks for bringing it up. Um, so yeah, clock source API. Uh, we're getting into kind of like the POSIX layer here. Um, let me see. Yeah, so this is, again, like we're trying to massage the network time back into the system. Um, it's going to, it's always going to, we don't want to disrupt the kernel, essentially. We want to maybe provide some sort of offset local to this one clock, which I think, Nico, I don't know if, um, can someone uh, hand Nico the box? So what are your opinions here, Nico, in terms of network time synchronization? I don't really have an opinion with that. All I did with the time points is to convert what was uh, using absolute time reference into an API that people could use without making the same mistake over and over. But maybe, I think Andy is more opinionated about uh, having a different time representation than that. Hmm. I definitely appreciate the consistency. That's true, so definitely good work there. I think the, the, sort of what we did with a real-time clock might work where we have a local offset just for that particular clock. What do you think? I would have to study this a little more. I don't know the, about the details. Okay. I prefer not to express opinion out in a routine year with that. No problem. Okay, so I guess the idea with TSCH is that we're going to get nanosecond precision time, which is pretty amazing. Uh, I believe uh, PTP is probably on the order of microseconds, maybe to nanoseconds in later revisions. Uh, NTP, if I'm not mistaken, is like millisecond accurate, so it's not even that great. Um, but if we can get something like nanosecond precision time, it's well within the symbol period. Um, you good? Box? Toss, just throw it, just throw it. It's soft. How am I doing for time, by the way? You have like five more minutes for this talk and then 10 minutes Perfect. for your follow-up talk. Okay, cool. Go ahead. So I have not yet the background what is really happening in Zephyr, but um, I mean, all these uh, from Eternal 2.15.4, we have all this time synchronization within the network, right? So is the point now to get that out, to get it for other parts of the system? That's the point? Yeah, we want to okay. distribute this uh, clock source that's highly reliable within our system. Um, okay. Yeah. okay. And I think what we've done in the past, like for PTP, for example, or um, I think there's an SNTP, simple NTP, uh, we basically just use the clock real time and then just done a, a straight offset. So every time we get an update, just do the straight offset. And it's um, it's not going through the device uh, driver API, so there's no 
system call overhead, as far as I remember, I think there's only a system call when you're getting the clock back, which is, you know, here nor there. Um, okay, other architectures have really great clocks built right into, you know, I'm just, just saying that right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I'm just gonna try and breeze through ultra wideband raging. Um, as we discussed, like it's really great spatial accuracy. It's kind of the future for if you wanna have smart things happening inside. If you want to have you know really clear asset tracking in a building, uh, in a hospital, or uh, you know if you're playing a game inside, I had this great idea at one point. I won't waste the time to talk about it here, but uh, really it would be very cool to have this kind of uh, tangible uh, thing where you can get like extreme accuracy. Uh, I think it just opens up a whole lot of doors. Um, and I know that like AR VR is huge now and I'm sure they're gonna get into that. So I'm not gonna spoil it. I'm not gonna speculate. <laughs> um, in any case, it's definitely the future. I remember t we were talking about this years ago. So I think we should get there the sooner the better. Uh, I believe that's actually the last slide. So uh, if do we have any other questions or comments or kind of wishes and dreams or anything? Uh, because we still have Stefan here and Miguel we were also working on uh, the Linux side of, of IEEE 802.15.4.